I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> so uh, I will begin by uh, uh, reading a, uh, some opening information uh, for uh, you and I believe for the radio broadcasts that will eventually uh, follow this evening. Uh, welcome to the Commonwealth Club. You can find the club online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter and our YouTube channel. I'm Philip Taubman, uh, adjunct professor at Stanford University's Center for International Security and Cooperation. I uh, was, uh, during my journalism career, uh, one of the jobs I held was Moscow bureau chief at the New for the New York Times, and I am the moderator for uh, this evening's program. Today, I'm very pleased to be in conversation with our special guest, William Taubman, Professor Emeritus at Amherst College, author of the Pulitzer Prize winning Khrushchev, A Man and His Era, and this new biography of Mikhail Gorbachev. And as you have uh, already surmised, we are brothers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, today, we're going to uh, have a unique conversation about Russia, then and now, and what William terms the importance of leaders who understood that the value of power is its ability to create a better world. Just a little background on Brother Bill. Uh, he, he got interested in uh, Russian and Soviet affairs uh, as an undergraduate at Harvard, uh, and then went on to uh, get his PhD at Columbia, and then uh, went to uh, work as an assistant professor at Amherst College. I remember uh, I'm a few years younger than Bill, uh, going up with our parents uh, to Amherst when he started work there as a professor made a big impression on me. Uh, and Bill is still at Amherst now, many, many years later. Uh, he worked there uh, as a, a wonderful teacher, very uh, admired teacher and uh, author of several books. The, the one uh, that I cited a minute ago, uh, the Khrushchev biography, as I said, won a Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and now, of course, we have a new biography by Bill of Mikhail Gorbachev. So uh, please join me in welcoming Bill. <laughs> um, so I should say that, uh, you know, I, I uh, in the years that I worked in Moscow as the Times correspondent and then as bureau chief, I had my own encounters with Gorbachev. He had taken office uh, just a few months before I arrived as a correspondent. Uh, and then uh, Bill got to know him. And in some of the more recent encounters that I had with him, he sort of playfully refers to us as the Brothers Taubman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Bill, let me, let me start by asking you, uh, you know, your book opens with a quote from Gorbachev. Uh, who likes to speak in the, in the sort of third person. And it, 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 the quote, if I have it correctly, is Gorbachev is hard to understand. Tell us what he meant by that and what you think that means. Well, I had, uh, I had decided to write his biography in 2005. And through people I knew who had worked for him, I didn't ask his permission because I was afraid he might not grant it. I informed him I was going to do it and asked for his support. And the word came back that he would be supportive. And shortly after that, my wife Jane, who's sitting in the front row, taught Russian at Amherst for many years, along with me, went to a concert in Moscow. We knew he was going to be there. It was in his honor. And I approached him. He knew I was working on this, but only for a few months. And he said, how's it going? And I said in Russian, Medlina, slowly, Mikhail Sergeyevich. I said it in an apologetic way, and he said, don't worry, Gorbachev is hard to understand. <laughs> and my first thought was, that is quite an amusing remark from this guy. My second thought was, I'm going to start my book with this. And of course, 11 years later, I did. Uh, I thought it was a wonderful remark because it suggested that his life is complex, which it is, but it also suggested to me, and this I wasn't sure about immediately, that he himself might find his life to be hard to understand. 
And sure enough, I think that is true. And it was confirmed by Alexander Yakovlev, one of his closest allies, who said in his memoirs, words to that effect, that Gorbachev shies away from trying to understand himself and in fact doesn't. We could talk about what it is he doesn't understand or what about him is complex to understand, but maybe I'll stop there, Phil, and, and uh, we can continue. Well, he certainly was uh, a puzzle in many ways to those of us who were there as journalists trying to uh, decipher what was happening. Uh, I vividly remember you know, the first stories that I filed uh, were received in New York by very skeptical editors. Uh, let's not forget, this was uh, just within a few months of uh, the serial uh, expiration of, of long-standing and short-standing Soviet leaders, Brezhnev, Andropov, Chernyenko, and then suddenly there's this new face starting to do things that seem out of the ordinary. Uh, and the editors in New York thought that some of us were credulous in writing about it uh, and, and assuming that there was change afoot. So, Bill, I think, you know, one of the things that always puzzled those of us who were there as correspondents was whether Gorbachev came into office as the general secretary with a plan to radically transform the Soviet Union and the Communist Party or whether he sort of stumbled into that strategy uh, once he was placed in office? My answer would be uh, neither. Uh, that is to say, I think he had an idea of what he wanted to do in the long run, but it wasn't specific, it wasn't entirely clear how he would go about it, in what kinds of stages, what kind of sequence, and that emerged as he began to encounter difficulties and achieve successes. But in my book, one of the things I do is I begin in the beginning. I begin by talking about his childhood and his grandparents and his parents. And I try to show that even as a boy growing up in uh, the countryside, a peasant with an illiterate mother and a barely literate father, living that life, born in 1931, experiencing, although he was very, very young, famine, collectivization of agriculture, the great terror of the late 30s, the war. The Nazis actually occupied his village for several months in 1942. More famine, late Stalinism with all of its horrors. I think by the time he went off to Moscow University in 1950, he already, in a kind of elementary way, could see through a lot of the propaganda and the indoctrination. I can give examples of that. But that was the beginning. Then you can see him at Moscow University beginning to develop further doubts and questions. One of his best friends at Moscow University was a man named Zdenek Mlinash, who turned out in 1968 to be Alexander Dubček's right-hand man in the Prague Spring. Now, Mlinash in the 50s was not the man he was to be in 68, but he was already an idealistic communist who saw through Stalinism. So by the time Gorbachev leaves Moscow University, on top of his direct experience with the horrors of Stalinism, which included the arrest of both of his grandfathers, he now had the perspective that came from the, the university. Uh, then he climbs the ladder in the provinces in the Communist Party, seeing as he does more of the inefficiencies and more of the stupidities, more of the irrationality around him. So by the time he comes to Moscow in 1985, he knows at least he uh, it becomes the leader in, in 1985. He knows that he at least must carry out reforms. But the real reforms don't begin until 1988, 89. And at that point, he introduces mostly free elections, a genuine parliament. The communism is now on the way out and he is turned out to be its grave digger. But I don't think it was a plan. It was more this evolution through his life of the notion that change was needed, then beginning with moderate change, and then in 1988 saying he's going to go for broke. So do you think the um, <clears throat> old guard communist leaders, the members of the Politburo when he was uh, chosen to be general secretary, understood that they were putting a uh, reform agent in place or did they think they were simply going to get a more youthful 
uh, management of the old system. I think they thought they were going to get that, use more youthful management of the, old, of the old system, but also some reforms. They did not expect him to do what he ultimately did, which was to usher them out of office, to destroy communism, to finish off the Communist Party for the most part. And as they began to discover that this is what he was going to do, they turned against him. And that confronted him with a choice. How would he handle them? He was afraid that they might oust him if he moved too fast. At one point, he, at one point he referred to them in a conversation with one of his top aides. He referred to the party itself as a rabid dog, <laughs> which he had to keep on a tight leash. And so he held them close and he refused to do what he was urged to do by Yakovlev and other aides, which is break with them early on. He refused to do that until they broke with him in August 1991 and attempted a coup against him. Just say one more thing. Jane and I interviewed Yakovlev at one point. We had, I should add, eight long interviews with Gorbachev himself, about two hours each. And I could talk about that if you're interested. But we had an interview with Yakovlev early on, and he said Gorbachev made a big mistake. He should have gotten rid of these guys who had appointed him very early on. And we said something like, but, but you know, would they have tolerated that? And he said, yes, because they were scared of him as the leader. They'd been scared of Stalin, scared of Khrushchev. They were scared of him. He should have kicked them out and brought in new blood right away. But about 15 minutes later, in the same interview, we heard Yakovlev say, well, of course he had to be cautious. You know, contradicting himself, showing that this, this decision was a very difficult one to arrive at, and that Yakovlev himself, 10 years later, still wasn't sure what was the right way to proceed. So, you know, I think one of the kind of lingering questions about Gorbachev, uh, it, it was true when we were there as time passed and then um, later on uh, before uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, was he overly cautious uh, you know, to achieve the kind of change he wanted? Did he try to move too incrementally? You know, what's interesting about this is that he himself has debated this question with himself over the years. He was doing it, I think, when he was in power and still does it today. Did I move too fast? or did I move too slowly? I think when he was in power toward the end and immediately after, he thought he had moved too slowly, as you imagined. That if he had moved faster and broken with the party and attempted more quickly to develop the mechanisms of a market economy, that would have been better. But in retrospect, I think he feels he moved too fast. He said in recent years that it may turn out to take decades to democratize the Soviet Union. He has even said it may take the whole 21st century. Now he is now instructed by Putin and by what's going on now in Russia. But I think what he's saying in effect is I moved too fast. It couldn't be done as fast as I wanted to do it. It may take a century. And this is now me speaking rather than he. It may never happen. Given, given the nature of Russia, it is just very difficult to democratize a country that has had a history of authoritarianism and totalitarianism and a total of five chaotic months of democracy in 1917 and six years or actually less under Gorbachev. You know, I, I know I was asked a lot when, uh, when I left the Soviet Union in, at the end of 1988 and and they weren't yet in the kind of radical phase of dismantling the Communist Party that you talk about. But it clearly, the country was changing uh, in, in striking ways. And people would ask, how long do you think it's going to take for Russia to become a democracy? <laughs> and, you know, I remember saying to people, it's going to take at least several generations. Uh, and I'm afraid that's proving to be true. So I know there are questions here. We'll get to them in a, in a few minutes. Uh, quite a few of them have to do with the current state of play with Russia. So let's deal with the history a little bit more first. Uh, you know, I think uh, there was this amazing moment. Some of you may recall this uh, when Gorbachev went to Beijing 
uh, and it was just at the time of the uh, d democracy movement in China and the building of the demonstrations in Tiananmen Square. Uh, and in fact, the Chinese communist leadership, uh, uh, you know, struck back against the demonstrators literally within hours of Gorbachev's departure to return to Moscow. And, it, you know, one of the questions that a lot of us thought about at the time was the Russian economy was in a stupor by the time I got there in 1985, this whole notion of a other superpower, yes, militarily, certainly in nuclear weapons terms, but economically it was not even uh, competitive with the uh, Western uh, economies. And Gorbachev put all his, he bet big on political reform. He bet big on Glasnost, which was opening up the press. Uh, but he really never tried to reform the economy and get consumer goods into the hands of Russians. Do you think that that was a, a pivotal mistake he made? Could he have bought himself time on the political side if he tried to fix the economy? I've heard that not only from Westerners, but from some of his former advisors, including economists. And they say that's what he needed to have done, either early on or later, to flood the consumer market with consumer goods and give people a sense that their lives were improving rather than disintegrating. Why didn't he do it? Well, in the first place, uh, Soviet industry wasn't equipped. They hadn't been able to produce quality consumer goods. What he tried to do was to convert military enterprises to the production of consumer goods. But that took time, and it didn't necessarily work very well either because they were used to producing rockets rather than toothpaste. Uh, later, the possibility arose of getting big money from the West and using it to buy consumer goods. He didn't do that, but that's partly because he didn't get the big money from the West mm -hmm. that he had hoped for. So I think you can make the case that that would have made a big difference, but you have to then immediately confront the difficulties which he did confront himself. This also raises, Phil, as I suspect you were going to ask anyway, about this raises the question of the Chinese path, the alternative. What the Chinese did, as many of you know, is they postponed political reform. They didn't introduce democracy. They still haven't. And as far as we can tell from President Xi's speech the other mm -hmm. day, he has no intention of doing so. <laughs> and they concentrated on creating capitalism, which has worked. So people often ask, I suspect Gorbachev himself asks himself, would that have worked there? Well, they didn't try that for various reasons. First of all, he was, he was really quite ignorant when it came to economics. His focus was on politics. He could imagine a democracy. He knew it included elections and free speech. But he was worried, he was still something of a Marxist. He was worried that economic reform down the road to capitalism would produce inflation and unemployment, and so he shrank back. There was also an element of ethnocentrism. <coughs> In those days, the Russians who advised him thought the Chinese were actually rather backward, and that far be it from Russia to try to learn from the Chinese. And then, of course, after the Chinese crushed Tiananmen Square, then Gorbachev was appalled by what they had done, and the fact that they had done it taught him that when the East European empire began to break up and Poland and the others began to break away, he would not use force in the way the Chinese had because he'd seen what that was like and it, and it was awful. So um, one more historical question. There was this very improbable partnership that developed uh, between Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan. Uh, and if you had uh, kind of looked at the two of them, uh, uh, you know, in early 85 when Gorbachev took office, uh, it seemed as if the countries were going in opposite directions and Reagan, of course, was hammering the evil empire. So what, it, what was it that Gorbachev saw in Reagan and, and from what you can tell from the other side, what Reagan saw in Gorbachev? Well, I, I puzzled over this a lot and, and trying to get to the bottom of it. I've read every word of the transcripts of the talks between Gorbachev and, Re and Reagan, first at Geneva in November 1985, then at Reykjavik in 1986, then in Washington, then in Moscow, then in New York. 
and Geneva is the particular is the turning point because both Gorbachev and Reagan said at the time and especially afterwards looking back that Geneva had been the turning point when they realized they could do business with each other but there's no sign of that or almost no sign of that in the transcripts so I came to the, the conclusion which may strike you as wrong that it was the personal chemistry between these two men that created the bond. And if I could be permitted to quote from my, my book. N no. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I, have a, I have a paragraph or two where I sort of ponder this. Um, and it begins with a quote from Donald Regan, who was Reagan's chief of staff. And Regan says that at Geneva, Reagan and Gorbachev looked, quote, like a couple of fellows who had run into each other at the club and discovered they had a lot in common. In their first one-on-one -on -one meeting between Gorbachev and Reagan, Reagan said to Gorbachev, we have both come from similar beginnings. He said, we both began life in small farming communities. He added, and yet here we are with the fate of the world in our hands, so to speak. And there are more parallels they both had happy childhoods in very harsh times. Uh, both preferred to reminisce about only one of their parents. Gorbachev's mother, this, I'm not going to go into this now, although it's really interesting. Gorbachev's mother had been the disciplinarian in their household, and she was the one who had actually whipped him when she thought he had misbehaved. So Gorbachev didn't like to reminisce about her, and Reagan didn't like to reminisce about his father, who was an alcoholic. Both of them were optimists who believed, as Reagan's biographer said, that success was there for the finding and that it would surely come his way. We all know that Reagan was an actor. So was Gorbachev in high school. He was the leading man in his theater group. He dated his leading lady. So did Reagan. He was the leading man in his high school theater group and he dated his lady, leading lady. So there are all of these parallels, and there's one more which I find particularly fascinating, but I'll only return to it if you would like me to. That's the parallel between their marriages, between, Reg between Gorbachev and Raisa on the one hand, and Reagan and Nancy on the other side. And I have in my, my book a description of the Reagan marriage by Francis Fitzgerald, which describes perfectly the Gorbachev marriage. So what I did, <laughs> I came to the conclusion that this personal chemistry created a bond between them. And I really think it did. Now, the fact that they both favored nuclear abolition, wanted to get rid of nuclear weapons, that emerged later. But it was this personal chemistry that created this bond, even though that may sound strange. Yeah, I think I would add, even add one other element <coughs> by coincidence, uh, hard to believe. Uh, Bill's been, of course, working on his Gorbachev biography while I have been working away on a biography of George Shultz, uh, Reagan's Secretary of State. Uh, and so I've, you know, tried to understand this relationship, too, in, with the additional figure of Edward Shevardnadze, who was the Soviet foreign minister, and what it was about the four of them that was different from their predecessors. Uh, and as some of it, I think, indeed had to do with, with where they came from. But uh, I also think that none of them were invested in the uh, ideology of the Cold War uh, the way their predecessors had been. They all came to the seat of power in their capital cities. Even Schultz, who had spent some time in Washington before in the Nixon administration, but not on national security affairs, they all came to uh, be the decision makers on international issues and nuclear weapons without a history of being steeped in the nuclear doctrines and the Cold War doctrines. Mm -hmm. And I think they all had a willingness to uh, think with an open mind uh, about the Cold War. And so I think that, that added to it. You know, one, one element when you look back, everybody remembers SGI, Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars. Uh, when you look back at the role that that played in their negotiations, it was like a science fiction phantom. Because on the one hand, it seemed to make, in Reagan's eyes, nuclear weapons irrelevant. He thought, wrongly I think, that if we had an S SDI, if we had this capability, 
to shoot down incoming rockets, then we wouldn't need incoming rockets and, and we could do without nuclear weapons. So on the one hand, it made this kind of connection possible. But then on the other hand, like the science fiction phantom, it evaporated that possibility because when Gorbachev looked at the threat of SDI, he wasn't going to concede for fear that this would turn out to be an offensive weapon uh, for which he would have no counterpart. Right. So SDI giveth and SDI taketh away. That is the possibility of nuclear disarmament. So you alluded earlier to um, the uh, demise of the Soviet Union and the question of Western aid. So there's a question from, <clears throat> from the audience that is uh, related to that. When the Soviet Union collapsed, could the United States and Europe have done more to encourage free enterprise in Russia and a more equitable distribution slash share in the new economy? Well, I, I think I'm not sure I would put it that way. What I would say is that the United States and the West in general did not help Gorbachev as much as he deserved to be helped. It began in 1989. Reagan leaves office. George H.W. Bush comes in. Uh, before Reagan leaves office, he's asked in Moscow during <coughs> one of the summits, what about that evil empire? And he says, that was another era, another time. And when they meet at December uh, 1988 in New York, Bush promises Gorbachev that he will follow in Reagan's fat path. And he even says, if I don't, He'll be on the phone from California telling me that I better do it. But when Bush comes in, he declares a pause. And for four or five months, they hold back from continuing what Reagan had begun. And this was a crucial time for Gorbachev. He was doing well. And if Bush had pushed forward along the path Reagan had started, and they, they had signed then the strategic arms agreement that they didn't sign until 1991, I think this really would have helped Gorbachev. Then we get to the end, 1990, 1991. By now, Gorbachev is in trouble, and he really needs economic aid. And we give him some aid, and the Germans give him even more, but not nearly as much as he wants and needs. And then what we do give him is advice, and even more to Yeltsin after Gorbachev leaves office, is forced out. And that advice is designed to help them create a market economy. But for whatever reason, it doesn't work in the way that we intended, and things go run amok. Partly the fault of the advice, probably mostly the fault of the Russian uh, propensity for corruption and many other things. But in that sense, um, whether or not we failed to help them in the right way, the, the, the brute fact is that many Russians, including Gorbachev, have concluded that we meant to hurt them, we meant to injure them. And Gorbachev has said some very harsh things. He's used the word, he said, they tore us down, they looted us. I think this is part of his general sense that he was betrayed by the West when he needed its assistance. That of course feeds uh, into, <coughs> I think, some of uh, Putin's attitude. We'll come to that yep. in a minute. I, 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 but you remind me of an anecdote that uh, George Schultz told me about. So uh, let's turn the clock back to January 1989. Uh, it's uh, a few weeks before the inauguration of George H.W. Bush as president. And you may remember <coughs> the uh, meeting on Governor's Island yes. uh, with Gorbachev, Reagan, and Schultz, and Bush, they were all there, Vice President Bush at the time. And Schultz describes a scene where at one point, Gorbachev comes over to him and you know, through his translator says to Schultz, uh, what's wrong with uh, Vice President Bush? And uh, Schultz says, what do you mean? And he says, well, he's standing there alone and doesn't seem to want to communicate with me. So. You know, Gorbachev sensed, I think, at that moment that, uh, that there was a turn about to happen as the administration changed hands. And to this day, George Shultz is still angry uh, at the pause that you alluded yeah. to that the Bush administration put in place, which was the, uh, pretty much the, 
the uh, recommendation of Brent Scowcroft, who was the National Security Advisor. And I think it's kind of interesting to me, I've done a, a lot of interviews for this Schultz book. The only person of that level of uh, uh, Washington leadership who declined to talk to me about George Schultz was Brent Scowcroft, whom I actually know and consider a friend. So to this day, there's tension many, many years later over this. Well, I, uh, Scowcroft in his memoirs said th that Gorbachev, he didn't put it this way. What he, what he was meant to say was Gorbachev may simply be a smiley faced yes. communist. Right. What he actually said in his memoirs is Gorbachev is trying to smother us with kindness to lower our guard, you know, to convince us that the Soviet Union is not a threat. And I, I think I have, in, I know I have in my book, and I'm sure you came across this too. They said some of the people around Bush, probably including Scowcroft, talked about Schultz as a failure, as a, as mm -hmm. a Secretary of State, gullible, mm -hmm. credulous. Yeah, well, I think they, they thought that this pell-mell rush towards some kind of accommodation with the Kremlin during the last years of uh, Reagan and, and, and during the Gorbachev period was uh, a danger. Uh, so, interesting piece of history. Let's, let's kind of vault this forward. There's some questions here which I will sort of paraphrase, if I may. Uh, I think a lot of people are curious here tonight, and, and they certainly are around the country. Uh, what d does some of Putin's hostility to the United States, which certainly played out in a very uh, kind of a dramatic form during the election campaign and in other ways, does that, is that rooted in some ways uh, in the Gorbachev period and particularly the, the end and demise of the Soviet Union? It's rooted in the Gorbachev period in an ironic way. In effect, Putin's platform consists of reversing what Gorbachev did. It's as if he's constructed his program by doing the opposite of what Gorbachev was trying to do. Uh, so in that sense, Putin is is building on, Gor on Gorbachev's legacy, but not in the way one would wish. Um, you know that Putin has said that the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. Interestingly enough, I think Gorbachev would agree that it was a catastrophe, but he would not think of it as a geopolitical catastrophe. I think he would think of it as a social, economic, and moral catastrophe in that he was trying to save the Soviet Union by democratizing it, by modernizing it, and instead it ended up destroyed on his watch. One other thing about this is that Gorbachev's criticisms of the United States track very closely with Putin's. Hmm. Gorbachev fiercely cr criticizes the expansion of NATO. This is partly because on February 10th, 1990, Secretary of State James Baker we know this from transcripts and from memoirs, assured Gorbachev that NATO would not expand one inch to the east. Mm -hmm. Well, it has not expanded one inch to the east. It's expanded hundreds of miles to the east up to the border of the Baltic states and Russia. So Gorbachev resents that. Gorbachev feels that Bush seemed to share with him a vision of a new world order based as much as possible on the renunciation of force. And instead, we got the Iraq war, and we got Libya, and we got the bombing of uh, Belgrade uh, and, and Yugoslavia. So Gorbachev, like Putin, is very critical of all of these things. Uh, and I even imagine, he's never said this to me, but I can imagine him thinking that when the United States faces Putin, with all of the things Putin has done to anger, the United States, that it's just maybe the case, uh, this is what I'm imagining Gorbachev thinks, that the United States is getting the Russian president it deserves. Hmm. So here's a, a kind of fun question. Uh, you know, uh, it recalls the fact that uh, Nancy Reagan <coughs> consulted an astrologer uh, about various things, including the dates of summit meetings and things for her husband. Was there a, a, any mysticism, a similar kind of mysticism on the Russian side? 
If, they, if there was, they didn't share it with me, <laughs> nor with Jane. Uh, there was some misunderstanding. At one point, Nancy got very angry at Raisa because Raisa didn't ask her about, I think it was her mother's, didn't commiserate with her, offer condolence on, on her mother's death, mm. Nancy's mother's death, and didn't say anything about the fact that Nancy had developed, I believe, cancer, breast cancer. Uh, but it turns out that Russians, this is a matter almost of cultural style, Russians don't like to talk about those things. And so if she didn't mention it, it wasn't because she didn't care, she wasn't being mean, she was just adhering to sort of Russian cultural norms. They also got on each other's nerves, and this Gorbachev confirmed. We, in one of our conversations, I quoted to Gorbachev something that Nancy said or wrote in her memoirs, when, they, when the two first ladies finally made peace, which was in the, in the United States in that December visit to New York. Uh, and what Nancy wrote in her memoirs was, I think that both of us were insecure. And I said to Gorbachev, does this sound right? And he said, yes, I think that's right. And to go back to that Francis Fitzgerald description of the two marriages, that's what she talks about. Both Nancy and Raisa were the ones who worried and fretted while their husbands in their excess of optimism sort of sailed along as if there was no problem. Uh, Nancy and Reagan, Nancy and Raisa were both viewed by many of their countrymen and women as difficult people, but their husbands didn't seem to notice. There are all kinds of these parallels, which in the case of the two wives made for enmity and here you may say I'm contradicting myself because I said the personal chemistry between the two men, the personal resemblances made for a bond and the personal resemblances between the two women made for tension. But I think I can get out of that contradiction by saying that when people are similar in possessing characteristics that they both are glad to have and think of as virtues, that promotes a feeling, a good feeling, whereas when they share uh, attitudes or characteristics that make them uneasy, here I'm acting like I'm an amateur psychiatrist. I, I, I am an amateur, although I did teach a course at Amherst for 10 years with a psychologist called Personality and Political Leadership. But anyway, that's my, that's my attempt to escape from what I recognize is a potential contradiction. There was certainly tension. I remember uh, when uh, <coughs> Reagan came to Moscow and, Na and Nancy Reagan and Raisa Gorbachev went to Len what was still called Leningrad. Uh, and uh, the correspondents who covered that visit, including my wife, who was working at the New York Times, uh, there was palpable tension between the two first ladies. Another way you can see this is if you go to the Reagan Library, you can not only look at documents, but you can look at film. The Reagan administration videotaped almost everything, uh, naturally enough. He was an actor. His advisors wanted to get the images right. So if you watch uh, the two women at the White House in, uh, well, that would have December 87, I guess 87, it was. Yeah. There's a moment when <clears throat> Mrs. Reagan is trying to get Mrs. Gorbachev to look at a portrait of Nixon <laughs> on the wall. And Mrs. Gorbachev, who prides herself on being something of a connoisseur of fine art, has noticed on another wall some more complicated and interesting art, and she's pulling away, and Nancy is pulling her back toward the Nixon. And then, then that, and it's their sound as well as video. And then at, at some point, Nancy says, let's go, and tries to pull her down the hallway. And Raisa says, just a moment, I have something to say to the press. And then there are films of Nancy and Raisa in Moscow the following summer, and the roles are reversed. Uh, Mrs. Gorbachev is trying to pull <laughs> Mrs. Reagan down a corridor, and Mrs. Reagan says, just a minute, I have something I want to say to the press. So it was really, it was really um, unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> I have to also admit, Phil, you'll be, uh, I, I spoke in Washington on, on Monday night and Michael Dobbs, who yeah, was Michael, in Moscow know, sure. for the Washington Post. My competitor. Your, your competitor. He was a commentator on, on my remarks, and he was generally favorable, for which I am grateful. He said, but I have 
one or two problems. And one is, I think, you shouldn't have talked about Nancy and Raisa. That, that, should, that looks like journalism. <laughs> That's freighted. Yeah. That's very complicated. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess Michael would know. Uh, so um, let me ask you about, you know, the, uh, the end of the, of the Cold War. It was such a dramatic uh, moment. Uh, when the Berlin Wall came down and, uh, and the Brezhnev Doctrine and the Soviet policies of sending Soviet troops to crush resistance uh, in Hungary, in Czechoslovakia, in uh, other East Germany. East Germany. Uh, in, in my view, this was Gorbachev's finest moment, uh, that he could easily have ordered the Soviet army uh, into Eastern Europe, and we would have had a very bloody showdown. Uh, and instead, he let Eastern Europe go. W why did he do that? Well, I think one reason is he didn't like to shed blood. In fact, he's almost unique among political leaders, and he is unique among Soviet Russian political leaders that he will go to great lengths to avoid using force and violence and shedding blood. So the prospect of that bloodshed on that scale would, would have precluded it. But there's a more positive reason. He had this dream, which was the counterpart to democratizing the Soviet Union at home, of not only ending the Cold War, but seeing Europe come together in, in what he called the common European home. When he said that, that sounded like propaganda. And I'm sure that Scowcroft and others around Bush probably cited that as an example of Gorbachev trying to pull the wool over our eyes. But he really meant it. Uh, he wanted reformers like himself to come to power in Eastern Europe. And so when they began to do so in 1989, he actually welcomed that. He had very little use for the old style East European leaders. He regarded them as troglodytes, uh, Honecker of East Germany, Zhivkov of Bulgaria, Ceausescu of Romania. He couldn't stand them, especially Ceausescu. There's some very funny stories about them. So as it, things began to change, he welcomed it. And here's something really interesting. When the Berlin Wall came down in November 1989, it was early morning, Moscow time. Gorbachev's age did not wake him up you know, to say the Berlin Wall is now mm. open because they sensed that he not only wouldn't be appalled by it, he might even welcome it as a sign that events in Eastern Europe were moving in that direction. So tell us a story, a Ceausescu, <laughs> Gorbachev story. I'm, I'm intrigued. Well, Gorbachev had to visit Bucharest. He had to visit the capitals of his East European allies, but he didn't want to go to Bucharest. He just hated the idea. And he went, and Ceausescu and his wife Elena, who were eventually liquidated, murdered by crowds uh, in the Romanian Revolution, they insisted on going everywhere with him and Raisa. And it was very hot, but they insisted on entertaining him at great length in a room with a raging fire in the fireplace. <laughs> and he assumed that this was because Reagan and he had talked in a pool house in Geneva <laughs> with a fire in the fireplace. So he was not only impatient with what Ceausescu said, he just, he was sweating buckets and he hated the whole idea. Uh, and when he came back to Moscow, I don't remember offhand what he said, but his words to the Politburo were, you know, couldn't have been nastier and, and more contemptuous of this Romanian leader. Must be something about fires and leaders. Remember Nixon used to have the fires uh, in the fireplace and the family quarters in the White House in the summer when it was, you know, 95 degrees in Washington. Uh, so there are a couple of questions here. Uh, I want to kind of get to current affairs a little bit. Uh, let's start with Gorbachev today. Uh, one question is, uh, what is Gorbachev's life like today? And secondly, uh, there's a, I'll add to that, and it's uh, here as well. Why is it that he is so reviled uh, in, in Russia today? Gorbachev could have lived in Germany after he left power. The Germans are deeply grateful to him for approving so quickly the reunification of Germany and then reunified Germany's membership in NATO. But he hasn't done that. He could have come to this country 
Some people tell me, in fact, every, it seems to me every other week, somebody comes up to me and whispers in my ear that Gorbachev lives in San Francisco. In the Presidio. In the said. Presidio, yes. Has anybody in this room ever seen him in the Presidio? <laughs> I was told on the way out here that he used to walk his dog in the Presidio. So it's possible. Uh, but he certainly has lived most of his time in Moscow. And I think he's done that partly to show the Russian people that he is proud to be a Russian and this is his home, this is his nation, and this is where he will live. But as you say, they are generally uh, angry at him, uh, dismissive of him. They despise him, many of them. Why? Well, what they would say Ranges, it ranges from he destroyed our country, the mm -hmm. Soviet Union. He destroyed the empire. Uh, there was an economic crash under him and, and under Yeltsin afterwards. It's all of those things, but then there are some more subtle things. I think that Russians have traditionally wanted or respected what they call a strong hand leader, like Putin. Uh, and Gorbachev was softer and more gentle. Gorbachev wanted to convince them rather than command them. Uh, this, is, this is among the things that I've heard said about him to condemn him. Get this. One of the things they say is, he listened. <laughs> that was a negative. Another was, he changed his mind, <laughs> as if that's illegal. Um, so there's something in Russian political culture there's some norms there which he violated, uh, and they hold that against him too, along with the loss of empire, the loss of the country, and many other things. He also talked too much. As things got worse, he talked more and more. It became a kind of joke. I think people like Baker and Bush, they didn't say this to me. I inter interviewed Baker and corresponded with Bush, but I sensed that by the end, they thought of him as a long-winded, uh, fantasizer and really were impatient with him and wanted him to get down to business. You know, uh, when after he'd left <clears throat> office, uh, Gorbachev came to the New York Times for a luncheon that I attended. Uh, and uh, the publisher of the New York Times usually asked the first question at these lunches, and he did. Uh, and the lunches usually last, um, you know, an hour, 75 minutes. One question, 40 minutes later, Gorbachev was still answering that question. Uh, well, it, it, since he left uh, office, he has created a foundation, and it's a thoroughly worthwhile enterprise. It makes charitable contributions, particularly to fight leukemia, from which Raisa died in 1999. It has a think tank, it has conferences, it has publications. It does very good work around the world. Uh, and I've attended several of those conferences, which he has chaired. And the same thing has happened at a couple of those conferences. His introductory remarks will use up almost the entire time, <laughs> leaving very little for the speakers who were asked to speak. It's sad because he had a reputation when he came in for being a wonderful listener. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things I try to show in the book is, is the arc of this life. I, I view him... I view him as a tragic hero, heroic in that he eliminated the last vestiges of totalitarianism. He ended the Cold War more than anybody else. He laid the groundwork for democracy by setting up free elections and a, and a functioning parliament. But in the end, he failed to save the country he had set out to save. He had to watch it crumble and collapse. He was forced from power, but even before then, you can see him begin to act somewhat irrationally and erratically at key moments, as if the realization that things aren't working out has not paralyzed him, but, but thrown him off his game. Uh, one of the ironies is he turns out to have been much better at manipulating the old system to get its leaders to adopt a new system, much better at that than operating the new system himself. He was much better at the old bureaucratic politics than he was at the new democratic politics. And so somebody like Boris Yeltsin, who was a kind of instinctive uh, politician, 
populist, maybe even demagogue, just handled it much better. So go back, I, <clears throat> I, I want to ask, uh, ask you to talk a little bit more about his life today. I'm curious myself. He has an apartment in Moscow. Yes, sir. Does he move around the city? Does, is, does he walk his dog in Moscow? Uh, uh, d you know, is he um, someone that Russians in Moscow would encounter, or does he live in a kind of hermetic world, sealed off from that? He lives. In, he lives in a big villa outside of Moscow, in uh, about 40 minutes drive. I've not been there. One of the things that happened was all our interviews took place at his office, never at his home. Uh, and for many years, he lived there with his wife before she died. And after she died, his daughter, they have one daughter, Irina, she and her daughters lived with him. And then they lived nearby in a separate house, but close enough so that they could come to his rescue if he needed it. Uh, but now, as far as I know, she spends most of her time, or at least much of her time, in Germany, partly for the sake of her husband's health, but also... I heard from people around Gorbachev because she couldn't take any more the kind of criticisms and attacks on her father that are so frequent in Moscow. So what does that mean? At the age of 86, going on 87, with high blood pressure, diabetes, several operations behind him, he lives alone in a house, big house, with chef, bodyguards, chauffeurs, but it's very sad. But it's, uh, I, I asked on our most recent trip there, I asked people around him, uh, does he feel terrible? Is he unhappy? And they said he insists he's still happy, hmm. if only because his daughter is now free of all of these pressures and strains on the family. Uh, and indeed, he has just published a book which contains new material, but certainly also a lot of old material, and its title is Ya Astaius Optimistum, I Remain an Optimist. And I think it's more than just putting on, you know, uh, a happy face. I think this man, as I said before, is remarkably optimistic and self-confident. These qualities came out of his childhood. I mentioned his harsh mother, but his father was a wonderful man. His grandparents were wonderful. If you look at the book, you'll see pictures of them with him as a boy, uh, and at one point he says about his childhood, he says, we were practically beggars, but I felt wonderful. He emerges from his childhood, confident, self full of self-esteem, optimistic, trusting in people, and that those qualities are still there despite everything. So here's a question that just came in. Has Gorbachev read your book? Does he <laughs> commented on it? I sent him a copy of the book uh, with an inscription, and I heard back from the director of his foundation that he thanks me at dushi, from the heart or soul, but he doesn't read English, I knew that, so for the, uh, he won't be able to read it until the Russian translation comes out, which should be in a few months, and at that point he will give me his впечатления, which means impressions. <laughs> so I'm waiting for his impressions. I, I should say, though, that when I was trying to convince him to help me as I worked on the book way back in 2006, 7, I gave him first a copy of my Khrushchev biography in English and then in Russian. And after a long period of time, he came up and patted me on the arm and said, good, solid work. <laughs> now, that was fine. That was OK. <laughs> uh, I would have liked more, but well, the interesting thing is that a lot of people who worked with him, both in the provinces, in Stavropol, and then in Moscow, and who like him in many ways, say that he was reluctant to thank people who worked with him and to praise them, whatever that means. And so I have to admit that I expect his Pichitlenia impressions may not be entirely favorable. <laughs> so we can't let you go. Uh you know, understanding you have not yet written a biography of Putin, but, uh, you know, I think uh, there's a couple of questions from the audience here, and I know I get asked this a lot myself. Uh, 
How would you describe the relationship between Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump? I believe that although all the evidence is at the moment that they are trying to get along, maybe get along a lot better than their politics, especially our politics, have allowed them to. We know that Trump never speaks ill of Putin and looked as if he was contemplating some kind of good relationship with him, but was sort of uh, derailed by all the things that Putin has done and by the reaction to that. I think that although they are trying to get along, they share, this takes me back to comparative personalities, I think they share certain psychological characteristics which could make things very dangerous for them and for us if they ever decided to clash. What I have in mind is neither one likes to be criticized. Both of them seem to like to take revenge against people who they think have betrayed them. So what worries me is, although they're trying to get along, and if, you know, if Congress and everybody else stood aside, I think they'd have a meeting and try to make a deal, Phil. Yeah. Uh, what worries me is at some point, each one will decide that the other one has betrayed him and lash out in a way that would be quite unusual and would be traceable back to these personal characteristics, this, this hatred of being betrayed and, and this pattern of lashing out against those who betray them. Uh, so a little bit more about Putin since, uh, you know, Russian history is your uh, field in some ways. Um, is he, uh, I think the latest cover of The Economist has, uh, you know, the new czar uh, with a picture of Putin on the cover. Uh, is he sort of the, the manifestation of this, uh, this kind of uh, totalitarian or authoritarian streak that has seemed to uh, deformed Russia for th a thousand years? My short answer is yes. He's a kind of combination of czar, czardom, and KGB. Um, you know, he, he has not resurrected communism. He knows that that ideology won't get him very far. He has emphasized nationalism, patriotism, orthodoxy, religion, uh, all of the things that underlay czarist rule. And he he doesn't look like a czar. He's a small man, you know, who he doesn't, doesn't look like Alexander III, who in the 1880s was this giant who rode horseback, although Putin does ride horseback. Um, Without his shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> but he behaves like a czar. And, and here's something. At one point, Gorbachev says, I forget when, might have been 1990, he is trying to figure out why Yeltsin seems to be more popular by then than he is. And he says, Gorbachev some, says something like, uh, you have to behave like a czar, a czar, and this I cannot do. You know, as if to say Yeltsin, for all of his populism, is this big guy who, gruff, rough, tough guy who looks like a czar and behaves like one, but Gorbachev can't do that. Well, Putin does too. I would, uh, I would disagree with Masha Gessen, who has just written a book about the future uh, as history and claims that Russia is heading back toward totalitarianism. The way I define totalitarianism, it's not. It's authoritarianism. It's something different. For example, there is one newspaper in Moscow which tells the truth. And guess what? Gorbachev is a co-owner of it, along with an oligarch, <laughs> and Putin allows this. There's one radio station, Echo Moskvi, which tells the truth. And although one of its correspondents was recently assassinated, and we don't know who did it, but we might suspect, still this radio station broadcasts. Uh, Russians can travel if they have the money now without permission. In Soviet times, they either couldn't or they had to get permission, which wasn't always granted. Uh, there are various ways in which life is better for Russians today, as long as they don't cross Putin in the public sphere. You know, they can say what they want. We attended a conference in Moscow a couple of years ago, an academic conference in which people spoke very clearly 
against Putin without naming him. And we asked them about that and they said, we can do it here, but we can't go out on the street and do it. Two people on the street might be arrested. So it's still, it's, it is now authoritarian, it's not yet totalitarian. For academics like me, this is a big distinction. Uh, but I think it is for people too. So let's uh, close on a, on a personal note, I guess. Uh, here's a question from the audience. How did the brothers Taubman find this amazing common path to Russia? <laughs> so you go first. Oh, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Bill was, uh, you know, was uh, preceded me. Uh, I think this in some ways stems back to our family, uh, to our mother and father. Our mother in the sense that uh, her family uh, came from Odessa in Russia, uh, and our grandfather uh, uh, was involved in the, what was it, the 1904? 1905. Five, uh, you know, uprising, and then fled uh, 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 Russia, ended up in New York. And I believe uh, my, our mother uh, was brought up at least early in her life uh, speaking Russian as well as English at home in, in, in New York City. And then our father was a journalist at the New York Times, Howard Taubman. He was a drama critic and music critic. And so uh, he was also interested in Russia. Our parents went there. I still find this hard to believe in 1935, I yes. think, uh, to see what was going on. I think they were sort of curious. They were a couple that could easily, I think, have drifted into the far left, but they didn't. They went, they saw the Stalinist regime and I think were, found it repugnant. Uh, so, but there was always a lot of discussion about Russia in our household in the Soviet Union. And then I, I still remember, and this is where I'll hand off to you, well, I guess I, I should explain how I got involved. Let me do that first. So I had no intention of getting involved in uh, covering the Soviet Union. Uh, Bill was already established in the field uh, at Amherst. And, uh, and then the New York Times, out of the blue, asked me if I would be interested in going to Moscow as a correspondent. And I found the offer uh, very alluring. And I actually called Bill and I said, if, we, if I do this, first of all, do you mind? Because I don't want to horn in on your territory. Uh, and Bill very graciously said he would help me, uh, you know, learn as much as I could. But to go back to the anecdote, and then you can pick it up, was it 57 when Khrushchev came to New York? 59. 59. And at one point, uh, he, uh, his motorcade brought him to the corner of 72nd Street and Central Park West. And, you know, the motorcade route had been announced in advance. And I remember I was, you know, if it was 59, I was 11 years old. You were the pack leader at this point. And, and you said, let's go down and, and see Khrushchev. <laughs> and indeed we did. We stood at the corner, right? You no, know, I, I knew I'd been there. I didn't realize I took you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, enough of my account of this. Well, we have just a, a minute to go. Okay, well, I'd add two things. One, I was a news junkie in the 50s, fascinated by the Cold War, Khrushchev and Eisenhower, then Khrushchev and Kennedy. Little did I know I would eventually write a biography of Khrushchev. Uh, the other thing was some of these conversations in the family at the, at the dinner table, uh, at which some relatives, uh, not that close, expressed a kind of admiration for much of what Stalin had done I already knew that Stalin had, been, had become a kind of mass murderer, and I wondered, how, what, how do I make sense of this? And I began to wonder how, what was the connection between the original Marxist ideal and the Stalinist concentration camps? And I began to study that in college. I majored in history, Russian history, began to study Russian. I continued to work on this in graduate school, and I made this the, the, the spine of my course on Soviet politics at Amherst. That is, where did Stalinism come from? Was it a reflection of Russia? Uh, to what extent was it a reflection of Marxism? It couldn't be direct because Marxism went in various directions. But this whole effort to understand Stalinism and where it came from, and then to understand its legacy. Once it existed, could it be reformed by Khrushchev, by Gorbachev? This makes it sound much more coherent <laughs> I'm sure that it actually was, but it's these kinds of ideas that, that have animated me for a long time. 
And I still remember, <clears throat> maybe you were already at Harvard at this point, a young New York Times reporter named Max Frankel, some of you will remember the name, he went on to be executive editor, came to our apartment uh, in New York uh, to ask our f father uh, uh, what he thought of the possibility of Max going to Moscow as a mm. correspondent. Uh, and I think that may have had something to do with the fact that our father went in 1958 and spent a month in the Soviet Union writing about the cultural scene there. Uh, and uh, I think that was his, our father's uh, uh, kind of following his own curiosity about Russia. Uh, and then that sort of established him as someone who knew something about at least the cultural scene in Russia. And that brought Max to our uh, apartment. So I'm afraid we've, we've run out of time. Uh, I, I want to thank Bill for coming all this way. It's easy for me to get here. I'm just down the block at Stanford, but Bill's traveled all the way across the country. Uh, and uh, just to uh, make the closing remarks, uh, our thanks to Bill, Professor Emeritus at Amherst College, author of the new biography of Mikhail Gorbachev, and a reminder to everyone here that Bill's book is for sale, uh, and he'll be pleased to sign copies outside this room immediately following the program. I'm Philip Taubman, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>